Hey, this is Corey from The Overlook, and we go over the books that you may have overlooked. Simple as that. This story is something that was recommended to us for months. So, this is Lock and Key. Welcome to Lovecraft. Written by Joe Hill, son of Stephen King, and illustrated by Gabriel Rodriguez. So if you get creeped out, and it's not my fault. I haven't watched the show yet, but I will be soon, so don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to tell me all the stuff they change. I just want to give one last final thank you to all the loyal subscribers that keep us going, and to all the new ones. Welcome. Two teenagers walk up to a wooden door with weapons in hand. One with a hatchet, most likely bought at some nearby super center, and the other with a revolver slips snugly behind his waistband. A woman answers the door, Mrs. Locke, and the two introduce themselves. First, the boy with the pistol states his name is Sam Lesser. Mr. Locke, her husband, was his guidance counselor last year. The other attempts to hide a smile before he slips out that his name is Al Grubb. Well, the two boys are quite away from the city, Mrs. Locke says. To that, Sam assures her that they happen to be in the neighborhood, and, for the record, he remembers Mr. Locke showing him a picture of their place. He even offered that Sam swing by and say hi sometime, maybe hang out with their son, Tyler. Mrs. Locke cautiously examines the boys and looks out to her front yard. A red pickup truck sits parked in her driveway. It's not hers. She comments on the truck and Al admits that the truck isn't theirs either. It's his uncle's. But don't worry, Al says. He doesn't mind. Down by the pond, Tyler stares down at his reflection. At the moment, he wishes that he could be anyone but him. Maybe if God brought down one little earthquake that would make his roof fall in, on his room, his parents would send him somewhere else while repairs were being made. Maybe Baja, to hang out and surf with Rod Fess. Maybe he could stay with his cousin, Orn. Orn may be a little overly obsessed with celebrities and their deaths, but it's better than the boredom Tyler is suffering now. His little brother, Bodhi, emerges from the water, with a handful of some tar-like substance. It's frog poop, he explains. He almost caught it, though, Bodhi quickly argues. To nobody, Tyler might add. Shortly after, the two brothers are joined by their sister, Kinsey. Kinsey stands with her arms on her hips in disapproval as she asks the two brothers what has them so busy, and if they are done playing around, then maybe they can help her and her dad finish painting the rest of the house. Breaks over. Tyler sulks and tells his sister that everything about their situation sucks. Kinsey questions her brother. She understands that he hates his life, but what's so bad about moving and having to paint a house? Nothing, Tyler replies. He just killed to get back to San Francisco. Mr. Locke walks into the open door of the house, overall stained with white paint, and freezes at the sight of Al and his hatchet. He never even noticed Sam standing against the wall with a pistol in his hand. Now, as Tyler looks down at the blood red urn, he wonders, why? Sobs and huffs are heard throughout the church room, but Tyler continues to stand silent. Eventually, Tyler finds an opportunity to sink himself away from the others into the hall, to be alone with his thoughts. Rod Fess joins Tyler in his silence, awkwardly asking him how he's doing, and his cousin Orn, telling Tyler that he can't believe any of this. From what he remembers, Orn last saw Sam Lesser at Ozfest, and he didn't seem like a psycho at the time, or well, any more of a psycho than anyone else there. Sam and Al killed five people in total that day, and now they're like so famous. The scowl on Tyler's face says it all, and Orn quickly retreats back into the main room with the other mourners. Next to sit with Tyler would be his uncle, Duncan. Before Duncan can say anything to Tyler, Tyler tells him that he already knows what his uncle is going to say. Tyler remembers back to when he was younger, 
His parents had just returned from a night out, and his father had a little too much to drink. Even so, as Tyler sat outside their bedroom, spying on them more or less, he remembers them speaking about how they almost got into an accident. His father told his mother that if anything ever happened to them, the kids would go live with their Uncle Duncan in Massachusetts, in the key house. Tyler remembers his mother asking his father if the key house was so safe, then why do they not live there now? To which his father replied that the key house didn't choose him, it chose Duncan. Tyler tells his uncle Duncan that somehow his father knew that something like this would happen. But how could he know something like that? Well, Duncan begins, his brother, Tyler's father, Rendell, was the original Boy Scout after all. He was nothing if not prepared. Tyler thinks back to his father, to how he could have never prepared for something like this, and he begins to cry. His uncle brings him in close, and tears flow down Tyler's cheeks. The three siblings make their way up the trail to the half-painted house, and Tyler is finding another reason to sink his head. Everyone in French club went to Paris for six weeks. Kinsey asks her brother, what's his point? He's taking Spanish. His sister doesn't understand, but that was just another beautiful example of how Tyler can't catch a break. Why his life just sucks. Bodie follows after his older siblings with a stick in his hand, earnestly trying to swat at a butterfly, or maybe a moth, passing by. It was too quick for Tyler to see, and too off topic for Kinsey to care. Suddenly, a deafening shot from a revolver echoes throughout the house. The fuck? says Al from the bedroom. Sam explains that Mr. Locke was starting to get up. At first, Mr. Locke had apologized for what he did, but ultimately, he said that he was going to make Sam choose. And so you shot him? Al reiterated, now frustratingly zipping up his pants while peeking his head out of the doorway. His hatchet lay on the ground, bloody near the blade, handprints on the wall, climbing up before sliding down to the floor. Anyone could have heard that. Sam assures Al that no one heard. Mrs. Locke said the kids were at the neighbors and they didn't see anything when they scoped the place out. But Tyler saw it all. After the shot was heard, he rushed to the window and he saw the smoking gun itself within Sam's hands. He saw Al. He saw the blood. And he wavered. He stumbled backwards into the open cans of paint, knocking Bodie onto the ground. Kinsey rushes to help her little brother first, all the while curious as to what had overcome her older brother. Al instructs Sam to make sure the onlooker doesn't make it to the woods and Sam complies. Somehow, he knows that it's Tyler. He beckons Tyler forward to come out of hiding. He doesn't want to have to hurt him. Sam walks around the corner of the house to see cans of white paint knocked over, with a trail of white footsteps leading to an open cellar door. Tyler, Sam calls out. He really, really doesn't want to have to hurt him. Admittedly, Sam knows that it may be hard to believe, but it's true. He peers down the darkened steps, following the trail of footsteps, and chuckles to himself. Tyler isn't even making this into a game. Up a nearby ladder, and behind a chimney, Kinsey grips onto her little brother Bodie, clenching him tighter than she ever has before. Ty? Ty? Hey, Tyler! Duncan doesn't think that he's even heard Tyler say anything since Pennsylvania. A few moments pass before Tyler utters his response. I said something in Pennsylvania? Yes, said Duncan. You said, I need to piss. It was a fascinating, and for him anyway, personally rewarding look into the mind of a gifted young man. Tyler, unimpressed by his uncle's vernacular, asks Duncan what school was like in the Northeast best education money can buy, Duncan brags. Just look at what it did to him. Four years in the Lovecraft Academy and four years at the Massachusetts School of Art. 
all combined to make the failed painter that sits next to Tyler today. Anyway, Duncan warns, Tyler should know that people around Lovecraft already know about what happened to them. It's not like it was publicized in the newspaper or anything, but Tyler's dad did grow up there, so eventually word just got around. Great, Tyler sighs. People get to be one thing in high school. Everybody already knows him, so he lucked out and gets to be the victim. Duncan tells Tyler that it's not going to be like that. Only Tyler can decide who he's going to be. To that, Tyler tells his uncle that his father was the guidance counselor. So could he try not to be? And for the record, he's not so good at it. The two arrive at the key house and exit the rented moving truck. Behind them, a blue sedan parks and the doors to the car swing open as Bodie leaps out in excitement. Kinsey slowly stands to her feet and gazes at the giant clapboard building. Some of the additions to the house row six, possibly seven windows high. Each addition of different quality, slidings, and deterioration due to age made the structure quite a sight to behold. The key house. Mrs. Locke uses her cane to help her get her footing and lifts her glasses with a sigh. She has been stuck in the car with her son Bodie for the better part of three days. Sanity left her a long time ago somewhere near Idaho, and for that reason, she encourages everyone to take a break. Come on, Ty. Nobody wants to play hide and seek. Sam looks around each dark corner for Tyler and tells him to rest assured. He isn't going to kill him. He just wants to help Tyler. In fact, Sam did this for Tyler. Remember? They talked about it that time. Sam said that he wanted to kill his mom and dad and Tyler said, well, he said what he said. Tyler remembers. Anyway, Sam felt a connection. He felt like Sam had been following the long trail of the lone footstep all the way to the discarded shoe left in the middle of the basement. Tyler uses Sam's momentary confusion and leaps forward with a brick grasped tightly in his hand. Sam hears the shuffling of Tyler's feet and lets out a shot in Tyler's direction. The bullet whizzes past Tyler and hits a nearby wall. Adrenaline pumps through Tyler's blood as he tries to knock Sam to the ground. Sam clutches onto his weapon, causing three more bullets to fire out, aiding in his off-balance trip to the floor, and the two crash onto the ground. Tyler swings the brick at Sam, and blood flies out of Sam's gashed skin and busted gum under his lip. But. He still stands. Sam shakily points the gun at Tyler, and with tears building in his eyes, Tyler throws the brick full force in Sam's direction. The brick hits Sam in the face and knocks his aim off center for the fifth shot. Tyler knocks the gun out of Sam's hand and begins to crawl away. Sam sobs as the open wound on his face touches the dirty basement air. Tyler crawls over to the brick that lay nearby and rushes to his feet and back to Sam once more, knocking him to the floor. Tyler hits him again and again and again and again and again until the brick itself begins to crack around the edges. Tyler stands to his feet and blood continues to drip from him, his shirt, the brick, and Sam. Tyler composes himself and begins to lift the floorboard to the inside of the house. His father's heavy body weighs down the door as he pushes up. Al, seeing this, smirks and walks over, fists clench, and kicks the dead body over, allowing Tyler to scuffle into the house. With Sam's pistol in hand, Tyler aims his sights towards Al and pulls the trigger. Empty. Al makes his way closer to Tyler telling Tyler that he counted the shots. Why else would he still be around? Now, where did he leave his hatchet? All Tyler remembers is seeing the tears roll down his mother's face as she buried the hatchet deep within Al's skull. Mrs. Locke tells her son to get away from the house. 
Hachi tells him to take his brother and sister and make their way to the neighbors, the Hutchinsons. But, Tyler begins, but his mom restates her instructions, now making it more clear that this wasn't a suggestion, but rather a demand. Tyler looks down at his dad's body that fell down the cellar hatch. He looks at the picture of his dad on top of the casket. He looks at the eerie, mossy pool in the backyard of the key house, and he wishes that he could be anywhere but there. Kinsey, after not being able to spend much time with her brother the last couple of days, asks if he wants to go look around the house with her. They get to pick their own rooms, and he can pick first, since he's the oldest. Tyler doesn't care. He'll just throw down wherever. Tears begin to form in Kinsey's eyes as she musters up the courage to ask her brother what's holding him together. She's cried so many times, she's lost count. She knows Tyler and their father butted heads, but Christ, Tyler was still like his favorite, so what's wrong with him? Tyler turns away from the pool briefly to tell his sister that whatever he was to their father, he wasn't worth it and returns his gaze to the water. Kinsey asks her brother what has him so distracted, what he sees in the water that's so captivating. But Tyler tells her that he can only see his reflection, his bloody, angry, lost reflection, brick in one hand, pistol in the other, the reflection of a killer. He tells his sister that it's nothing before wondering aloud where Bodhi ran off to. He hasn't been there since he was two, Kinsey reasons. He's probably exploring. Inside the house, within one of the rooms, in between two bookshelves, in between two lamps, above a fireplace and under the family crest, sit a pair of swords hung up on the wall. The swords are much too high for Bodhi to reach, so he has no other choice but to get creative. He grabs a chair and a couple of books off the bookshelf and suddenly he's six feet tall. Even with his short arms, he's still tall enough to... A glimmer from atop of a nearby door catches Bodhi's attention and the boy jumps down from his current setup only to make another, more precarious step for himself. Using a broom to knock down the item before examining it to find that it's nothing more than a key. Within the San Lobo Juvenile Detention Center, the guards and inmates are preparing to lock down for the night. The guards sweep the corridors and check the doors. One guard stops by a door when he sees Sam Lesser sitting cross-legged in his cell on the floor. The guard questions the boy, but Sam only replies that there is an echo in the room. If the guard listens closely, he can hear it. A perfect echo. The guard, done for the night, does not give the occurrence a second thought. Sam's just a weird piece of shit, he assumes. The guard leaves, and Sam runs over to the sink, which was filled to the near brim with water. Sam calls out to someone in the water, asking them where they went. They promised Sam a new home, a new face. A black-haired woman appears in the water and confirms to Sam that he already has both. No, Sam objects. She promised him better. This isn't better. She promised to set him free. And she will, the woman replies. Soon, all doors will be open, and the door to Sam's cell, the door to his cell, will be the first. Sam, saddened by the delay, asks the woman when. Her face begins to fade within the ripples of water and leaves Sam without another word. Bodhi enters the key to the lock to find that the door in the room leads to nothing more than the side of the house. The door swings open for him to only see nothing more than grass and weeds to welcome him. Still, interested enough, Bodhi decides that he has not had the opportunity to explore this part of the property and begins to take a step outside. As he takes his first step, Bodhi feels cold and light. The skin on his body turns pale and gray and collapses to the floor behind him. Bodhi examines his hands to find them to be translucent. 
he can see right to the floor. Also, there is a weird smoky energy wisping away from his body. Bodhi looks back into the house to find his body petrified on the floor. The sight causes him to take a step back before he decides that he should actually be doing the opposite. Bodhi dives on top of his body and his spirit assimilates back within his shell once again. The skin on his face now becomes flushed with color and Bodhi sits himself up and looks back outside as he tries to rationalize what just happened. Obviously, he thinks, it's time to close the door. What I Did This Summer by Bodhi Locke Well, bad guy shot his daddy, so his mom and his uncle Duncan drove them across the country. He saw like a thousand cows, and his older sister bought him an Indian spear, but he broke it. And now, they live in a big house named Key House. Oh, and then he found a secret door, and when you go through it, you turn into a ghost. It's fun to be a dead person. Maybe he'll see his dad's ghost someday. Mrs. Locke scans the crude comic before reading the note addressed to Bodhi's teacher. Some of the other kids in school were upset with it to say the least. Perhaps they should meet. Perhaps Monday. Damn it, Rennie, Mrs. Locke states. Why did you have to go and make them shoot you? Duncan accompanies her, handing her a glass of red wine, and softly states that his brother, Rendell, wasn't exactly the kind of person to just sit there and not stand up for himself. But that isn't it, Mrs. Locke states. Sam Lesser would have shot him one way or another, but Rennie just had to go and force the issue. Even so, Duncan has really stepped it up over the last couple of months. Mrs. Locke has really got to thank him for being there when they needed him most. This can't be easy for him either. Rendell was his brother after all. At first, Mrs. Locke questions whether bringing her family all the way to the opposite coast of the United States was a good idea at all. Taking the children away from the life they knew couldn't have helped. She shows Duncan Bodie's comic, telling him that her favorite part is the end where Bodhi imagines walking through a magic door and turning into a ghost so he can be close to his dad. Duncan scans the paper before he looks up at his sister-in-law and tells her that the comic reminds him a lot of the games that he and Rendell used to play. They used to pretend the doors in the key house were magic and you could walk through them and change into all kinds of stuff like warriors or ghosts. Mrs. Locke remembers her husband telling her about that a couple of times in the past, usually when he was wasted. He probably went and said something to Bodhi about it and it stuck with him. To be honest, she really can't say that she's surprised that he hung up on the idea. That kid lives in his own fantasy world. The first time Bodhi died, it turned into a ghost. It was really scary. But the second time, it was better. Bodhi looked at himself, all dead and everything, and you know what? He thought he looked like a sock, without a foot in it. After his dad died, they put him in an oven and burned him up and stuck what was left of him in a jar. That's called cream making. Bodhi got sick just thinking about it before, but his brother Tyler said that his dad couldn't feel it. His dad wasn't in his body when he got burned up. Bodhi didn't understand it at first, but now he does. It's like they burned up an empty sock. When you're dead, you go places in bright flashes. Sometimes you go to someone just cause you were thinking about them. Bodhi sees Tyler is taking another shower. They used to play fun games like Murder Blanket and Buried Alive and whack a Bodhi. But now Tyler never wants to play. He just wants to be alone and shower or something. Bodhi bets that it's really bad for your skin to be in water that long. It'll probably make Tyler's skin all wrinkly. As Bodhi inches forward, his spectral form cools the water considerably, causing Tyler to let out a yelp in unexpected shock. Other times, Bodhi tells the woman, things get all bright and you go see someone 
because they were thinking of you. His sister, Kinsey, was thinking about him, so he popped in to see her and didn't even know that he was going until one of those flashes hit and it took him there. Kinsey used to have rock star hair, but when they moved to Lovecraft, she changed it. Now she doesn't look like herself at all. She was in her room, holding her pillow, only she wasn't really there. She was really on the roof with him again. That's where they hid to keep from being shot by their dad. Bodhi could tell that's what she was thinking about. Not because he was a ghost, just because he could tell. And that's when he decided to show them. If he showed Kinsey and Tyler about how fun it is to be a ghost, then they wouldn't feel so bad about what happened to their father. But it didn't go like he thought, he tells the woman. He told Kinsey about watching her when he was a ghost, but she just thought that he was spying on him and used the F word. So he asked Tyler if he wanted to come be a ghost with him, and he even made the puppy dog face too. Tyler has a really hard time saying no to the puppy dog face. Usually. But when Tyler told Bodhi to get lost, Bodhi told Captain Stupid that he better get used to taking cold showers. Alas, with nothing else to do, Bodhi took the ultimate treasure finder 2000 to look for lost riches behind the house. He had previously made the ultimate treasure finder using a fishing rod and advanced science. It's kinda technical, he tells the woman. He wasn't even going to tell his mom about being a ghost, but she already knew all about it anyway. She approached him slowly before asking him if he went out to play as a ghost today, to which Bodhi responds, yes. He looked around for his dad, but he didn't see him. Maybe he just doesn't know they moved. Mrs. Locke avoids eye contact with her son, before sighing and telling Bodhi that if he does run into his father, to give him a hug and a kiss for her. Oh, and one last thing she tells him before she leaves. No more comics at school. It's really starting to freak out your teacher, Mrs. Clarkham. Mrs. Locke walks up the stone steps behind them and makes her way back to the key house, and Bodhi continues his search, loudly whistling for his own entertainment. Suddenly, the treasure finder gives a tug, and Bodhi pulls back on the line to find that his first treasure is... a can. Oh. As Bodhi examines the can, he hears a faint whistling coming from the other side of the stream, from within the well house. Bodhi wades through the water to make his way to the other side and declines the steps in order to lift himself up high enough to see past the bars into the well house window. With nothing in sight, Bodhi grows more curious and climbs into the small building. Hello? He calls. Anybody? Bodhi takes his first steps onto the dusty wooden floor and peers down the dank, dark well. His first test is a whistle. He lets out the same song he did when he searched for the treasure, only to find that the sound from the bottom of the well did not repeat his own. It made its own tune. Strange enough, the boy thought before asking the sound directly, Are you my echo? Go? Go? The sound of his voice bounces from wall to wall and rang all the way back up to meet him. Bodhi smiles at the occurrence. This house is certainly filled with, yes, a voice states causing Bodhi to freeze in place. Yes, I am, Bodhi. Terrified, the thought of a creature hiding at the bottom of the well brings Bodhi to his senses and he scurries out of the well house, all the while the voice telling him to wait and don't go. Bodhi rushes to his older siblings and the first thing Tyler says is that Uncle Duncan warned them about going into the well house. It's the only rule. The damn thing is caving in for crying out loud. But Bodhi pleads for Tyler and Kinsey to follow him. Seeing the expression on his younger brother's face, Tyler decides that he better check it out. He pokes his head into the well house and it examines the area briefly. He even calls out to the well only to be greeted by his own echo. And perhaps that is all that Bodhi heard, just his own echo. Exactly, 
Bodhi shouts, hoping that his brother is starting to understand. That is what she said. She said that she was my echo. Oh, did she? Tyler questions as he raises his eyebrow. Kinsey takes the opportunity to reason with Tyler that maybe Bodhi is right. Tyler then explains to Kinsey that there is about a century worth of old dust all over the floor, but only one pair of footprints, Bodhi's. And even if someone did manage to get into the well house and fall down the well, they would be screaming their head off right now. Their mom is having a hard time as it is, Tyler reasons with his brother, to try to quit all the nonsense before she wises up and sends him to a clinic for crazy people. That night, Bodhi dreamt that he was in the basement of his old home with his father. A lone light fixture swung from a low ceiling slowly as it dimly lit the ground beneath it. Bodhi remembers seeing the number 11 on a blackened door buried underground. A vicious dog, fangs and claws protruding as it snarls and pants, awaiting its prize buried underneath. The sound of scratching was deafening. Bodhi's father asks him if he wants to hear a knock-knock joke. Curious to what is going on around him, Bodhi questions his father. But that's not right, his father says. Now looking down at Bodhi, revealing a large gunshot wound through the right side of his face, you're supposed to say, who's there? After that, Bodhi got scared and woke up, which is silly, he tells the woman. Being scared of dead people is the silliest thing. You would think that he would know that by now. As a matter of fact, Bodhi could get used to being dead himself. Nothing can hurt you when you're dead, and nothing bad happens to you. Being dead is easy, and safe, and it's really cool. Everyone should try it. Everyone does, Bodhi, the woman replies, sooner or later. Oh, right. Anyways, Bodhi continues, that is when Bodhi decided to turn into a ghost and explore the well for himself. Bodhi arrives at the bottom of the well to find a young woman with long black hair that was complemented by her longer darker dress, combing her hair. She had a small pouch tied around her neck, and there was something about her that Bodhi found familiar. Is someone there? The woman in black called out. Is it you, Bodhi? Playing ghost? I heard your mother talking about you playing ghost. Is that what you're doing now? Bodhi is instantly caught off guard. No one was ever able to sense him before. He begins to fly to the top of the well, but the woman in black calls out for him, trying to comfort him by telling Bodhi that she isn't afraid. She just wants to be his friend. He has to be her friend because no one else can see her. She then asks for Bodhi to come back and talk to her when he isn't a ghost. He shouldn't be afraid of her because all she wants to do is talk. And besides, she'll be way down at the bottom of the well and he'll be all the way up there. So what's the harm? Bodhi couldn't argue with her. It was foolproof logic, after all. So, they become friends, and Bodhi proceeds to tell her everything that has happened to him since he found out the door makes him into a ghost. The woman in black, for one, is happy that Bodhi found the door. She appreciates his company, as it does get lonely in the wellhouse sometimes. Bodhi figures that there must be some way to get the woman in black out of there, but she tells him that it's humanly impossible. Even if someone dropped a rope, she would still be stuck there because the door to the well house is magic too. Echoes can come to life there, but they can't step through the well before fading away. It's okay though. This well is the woman's home now. She's used to it. This perplexes Bodhi. Just how long has the woman been down there? But that is hard to say. Right now, the woman tells him, she is his echo. When his father was a boy, she used to be his echo. And she's echoed others too. Oh, Bodhi's dad knew all about the doors and they used to talk about them all the time. There was lots of doors, she tells Bodhi. Doors to other worlds, doors to other possibilities, you want to be a grown-up? There's a door that will turn someone into an old person when they walk through it. 
there's another that will turn someone into a girl and it will turn Bodhi's sister into a boy. And then there's the anywhere key. With that one, someone could open almost any door and step through it into anywhere in the world they would like. As long as a person has a clear picture in their head of where they're going, they could unlock their bedroom and step into Paris. And that's when Bodhi realizes that the woman in black has been thinking about it all wrong. Bodhi explains that right now she can't go through the front door without fading away. But what about some other door? Some other door? Oh, oh, says the woman in black now understanding the child's unfinished thought. But no one has seen the anywhere key for a very long time. The woman in black tells Bodhi that the last person to see the key was his father, and he hid it away when he was a child, most likely for a very good reason. Anyway, says Bodhi, he brought her a mirror and the scissors that she wanted to cut her hair. He drops the paper bag containing the items to the woman. She then picks up the mirror, examines it, and smiles. Thank you, Bodhi. They're perfect. Within the San Lobo Juvenile Detention Center, Sam Lesser sits on the floor to his cell, stabbing at his forearm with a needle in order to make his newest tattoo. Between the added tattoos and the facial scars, Sam was only somewhat recognizable to the boy he was only a few months prior. Within the water-filled sink, the woman in black appears, telling Sam that she has something for him, something she promised. Excited, Sam jumps up to look inside the sink. What is this? What is she talking about? He asked quickly before examining the items. He didn't ask for any of these. But the woman replies that he very much did ask for them. For they are his new keys to his cell. And hopefully, he uses them to their fullest potential. When Sam Lesser and Al Grubb went to their summer house to kill them. Kinsey and her little brother Bodie went up a ladder to hide. That's how they stayed alive. Her father wasn't so lucky. Her dad's been dead for three months and three days. They moved across the country and now she's got an all new life going on in an all new town, Lovecraft, Massachusetts. She promises everyone that she's okay. The trick is to just keep things simple. It was very simple on the roof. This is what she told herself. Don't be heard. Don't be seen. One thing she did after she moved was get rid of her dreads. It was really hard to do. She just didn't want to give people another reason to stare at her. When they came to kill them, she wasn't heroic. She wasn't brave. And later on, they found bruises on her little brother's throat. That's how hard she was squeezing him to keep him quiet. She bit her lip until it bled. She just really didn't want them to hear her. Kinsey has grown up a lot in the last year. One thing she realizes now is that you only advertise your political beliefs on a t-shirt if you're seriously insecure. It's kind of pathetic. Besides, she heard Lovecraft Academy is pretty strict and she doesn't want to be the only weirdo. Kinsey is staying under the radar and getting her crap together. And most of the time, she feels like things are going all right. Except now and then, when she notices her own reflection and jumps because she doesn't know who's standing there. It's funny, when every time you look into the mirror and there's a face you don't expect to see. Elsewhere, within San Lobo, Sam Lesser tactically uses a mirror to watch as a correctional officer and a repairman approach. The officer, too preoccupied with thoughts of his fantasy draft at 3.30, he won't bother the repairman. He'll leave him to his work. Leave me? The repairman asks worriedly. Relax, the guard states confidently. There are three levels of security between the repairman and the outlaws. Truth is, a lot of the kids in lockup are more pitiful than dangerous. And there isn't one of them that has the wits to even suddenly 
Sam Lesser's arms reach in between the bars out of his cell with a piece of the scissors in each hand and begins to stab viciously at the officer. One piece of the scissor plunges into the man's eye and another into his jugular, sending blood spraying out in all directions. The repairman begins to panic, but Sam, Sam stays very composed. The repairman begins to run in the opposite direction of the cell as Sam swipes the officer's keycard, unlocking the cell door for him to open. He carefully lifts the pistol from the officer's holster, aims it, and bang, they're off to the races. One thing Kinsey kept from her old life, she's still good at running. Even better, actually. Now, she has so much more to run from. As Kinsey runs against reality, a dark-haired girl picks up her own pace to try to keep up with Kinsey. Both the girls finish the sprint ahead of the rest and the black-haired girl, exhausted, lifts her hand to introduce herself. Her name is Jackie. She tells Kinsey that no one has made her run that hard in a while. Maybe they could run together Saturday morning to practice before the meet against Milton. I'm busy Saturday, Kinsey says quickly as she takes a step back distancing herself from the other girl. Okay, what about next Saturday? I'm busy that day too. I'm busy like most Saturdays, so it's probably not a good idea. Kinsey begins to walk away, and she knows she made the right decision. They can't run together, because if they did, after they were done running, Jackie would want to talk, and she would ask Kinsey if she ran at her old school, and everything about her old life is off limits. Anyway, she has some reading to do. She reads. Her brother Ty copes by working every day after he gets home from school. It doesn't matter what it is. He's out mowing, weeding, raking, power washing. A bunch of stupid work. It's honestly probably the best thing for him, Kinsey tells herself. Her little brother, on the other hand, she is worried about. He has had some unhealthy ideas these days. Bodhi drags his sister hand in hand, telling her to just watch, just stand and watch. Her expression says it all. Bodhi is talking about the ghost game again. Bodhi slams the ebony key into the lock and unlocks the door to the side of the house. See, he claims, you open it with the magic key and then you walk through and then... Bodhi sticks a single leg out of the door before grabbing onto his chest in what Kinsey could only describe as a cheap imitation of someone getting shot in an old western movie. Bodhi coughs and wretches before he falls to the floor, petrified. Unamused, Kinsey tells her younger brother to get up, but Bodhi continued to lay there, still as before. Hey, don't just lay there. Do something, you creepy little turd. The worry begins to seep out of her words like bread around twine. Fine, she says, giving up on the situation. She's leaving. She's not playing, though. And for the record, she doesn't think this is funny. Still, Bodhi doesn't answer. Kinsey pokes her head from around the corner and watches her brother as he continues to play his dumb game. But... She returns to her brother's side and examines his body. Okay, she whispers out. Get up, Bodie. I don't like this. This time, when her brother doesn't respond, she looks out of the doorway. Maybe. Kinsey slowly lifts her hand and begins to reach out of the door. And just before she does, Bodie springs up. Something's wrong, he warns her. Something's terrible's happened. He's telling mom about it now. The one whose name means born at night. Okay, Kinsey says, just thankful that her brother is at least sitting up. She goes to tell her mom that Bodhi is being weird and annoying again. Maybe their mom can talk some sense into him. But before Kinsey can ask, she realizes that they have a visitor. Kinsey, Mrs. Locke begins, can it wait? This is Detective Mutuku. He is with the state police. He and her are having a talk about some things right now, and perhaps Kinsey should just hang out in her room for a little while. 
Kinsey complies and goes to her room. However, Kinsey soon finds out that she can still hear their conversation in full through the vents in the floor. Sam Lesser has escaped. Right now, every police officer in the county has eyes out for him. But for her peace of mind, Mrs. Locke interrupts the detective, telling him that he has no right to tell her about peace at mind. She has three children. Just him saying that makes her want to scream. Sam Lesser should have never even been tried as a child to begin with. Very well, Detective Butuku continues. 99% of escapees are typically recaptured within 24 hours, usually within three miles of the prison facility. And realistically, there's no reason to even believe that Sam knows where the locks are, or that he would even come east to begin with. When Detective Matuku leaves, Kinsey rejoins with her mother. Mrs. Locke, with her half-finished bottle of wine, looks into the open bottle and asks her daughter if she heard any of the previous conversation. She tells her mother that she did, and the two share a hug. They share a silent bond, one that Mrs. Locke could never replicate with Ty or Bodie. Kinsey asks her mother how long the police are going to be parked outside their house. It's just for now, her mother assures her. The police don't even think that Sam knows where we are. He knew where the summer house was, Kinsey replies with her eyes stuck to the floor. Mrs. Locke once again assures her daughter that everything is going to be fine. She lifts a pistol that was fastened beneath her waistband and sets it next to her bottle. The next homicidal maniac that comes their way is going to find another homicidal maniac waiting for him. But dad hated guns, Kinsey gasps. Your father wasn't around to voice his opinion. Look, it's in the nightstand by my bed, which is where to look for it if you need it. I already told Ty. With everything that's going on, Maybe they should stay home from school, Kinsey wonders. She just wants it to be over. Once the kids at school find out about this, everyone is going to be staring at her. Kinsey meets her mother's eyes and asks if Mutuku is some kind of African name. Yeah, Mrs. Locke confirms. She asks the detective about it. It's a tribal name. Apparently, he immigrated over when he was still young. The name means born at night. Kind of cute little accent the guy's got, huh? What's wrong? Mrs. Locke asks, after immediately noticing her daughter's expression. Nothing, Kinsey responds. Nothing. On the roof, Kinsey stayed alive by concentrating on making it through the next moment, then the next, then the next, and nothing has changed. She got through that, she can get through this. It's easy, she reasons. What worked there works at school too. Don't be heard, don't be seen. Don't do anything to attract the attentions of people and she will be all right. Kinsey walks alone, stuck inside her own head. She passes a couple of painters applying a fresh coat of paint to the walls and immediately feels her stomach turn. She rushes past the track coach and runs to a nearby window in order to vomit out everything in her stomach. I'm sorry, coach, Kinsey apologizes. I really don't like the smell of fresh paint. Jesus, I'm such a loser, such a freak. Uh, give yourself a break, the coach tells her, handing her a cup of water. With everything that you've been through, you're the bravest girl I've ever met. I mean, just getting up and making it to class has got to be hard enough. Kinsey grabs the cup of water and begins to drink. The coach notices the golden bracelet on her wrist and makes a point to bring it up. Is that a key? She asks, pointing to one of the engravings in the golden metal. Oh, Kinsey says. Yeah, it's like a reminder. Believing in yourself is the key to becoming a complete person. If you have the right key, you can unlock any door and it can take you anywhere you want to go. Yada, yada, yada. Kinsey says, quoting her father. It was super cornball, but you know, he was my dad. Anyway, thanks coach, I feel better. When Kinsey leaves the room, the coach waits a while and then she reaches up to grab a book on the bookshelf. It's an old yearbook 
from 1988, and within it contains a picture of the drama club from that year. From left to right, you have Mark Cho, Lucas Caravaggio, her, Ellie Whedon, Rendell Locke, Kim Topher, Aaron Voss, and one, Professor Joe Ridgeway. But the most captivating piece of the photo, to the coach at least, was the golden medal piece resting on Rendell's wrist. Mrs. Locke is there to pick up Kinsey at 2.30, just like she promised. Going home, she looks out the window and she's just about to jump out of her shoes because there's some strange girl looking into the car at her. It takes her a second to realize that it's her. Kinsey thinks to herself that she will probably spend the rest of her life looking out windows for Sam Lesser and jumping at every strange face she sees, whether the police catch him or not. However, she decides she is not going to jump when she sees her own face. She is going to take control. That Saturday, Kinsey goes to see Jackie and asks her, So, do you want to run? Sam Lesser parks the bus near a pier and sets it ablaze. The fire starts to consume the bus and smoke begins scurrying to the sky. Nearby, a fisherman attempts to light his cigarette. He flicks the worn lighter time and time again, but his cigarette never burns. Come on, the man complains. This would be easier if I scraped two sticks together. All I need is a light. The man is distracted mid-thought by the glinting light reflecting off his glasses. Mother Mary on the rag. What? What is happening on the coast? He stammers as he watches the bus explode in the fire. At that moment, Sam Lesser approaches the man and steps onto his boat. Isn't it something? It's like a movie. Sam then points behind him with his thumb, motioning at the mass of land across the bay. Is that Lovecraft over there? His question is interrupted by the sound of sirens in the distance. Sam lifts his pistol to the man's head. Second thought, why don't we talk about this while you steer? Let's go. On the property, in the well house, Bodhi sits on the window sill with a flashlight and a jar containing the lightning bug. Dodge, the woman in the well, calls out to Bodhi. At first, he does not respond, but then he asks, quite blankly, If you are my echo, why don't you look or talk more like me? Well... She replies, that's just not how it works, Bodhi. Oh, do you want to hear a knock-knock joke? This certainly is a strange conversation, but all right, go ahead. Knock-knock, who's there? Who? 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 What are you, my echo? Dodge, unfortunately, tells Bodhi that the joke isn't funny. I know, knock knock jokes are stupid. I don't think I'm coming to see you anymore. It was cool being the only one who knew you. Like, E.T. Like having my own alien. You probably don't know E.T. But you aren't my Echo. I don't know what you are. You said I made you, but I think you were already here. I wasn't even going to come talk to you tonight. But then I was thinking, Echo, are you still there? Before you can investigate, Bodhi hears a call from his sister Kinsey. Their mom says he has 10 minutes to be inside. It's almost time for bed. Okay, Bodhi calls back. Back on the boat, there is a deafening silence between the two men. The fisherman is still nervously flicking at his lighter. He knows that his time is short. Sam asks, so, is that it out there? Uh... Lovecraft? Yeah. The Locke family owns the whole end of the rock. I guess you kill all of them on the bus. You aim to kill me now? Yup, Sam responds as he squeezes the trigger and shoots the man point blank. Sam grabs onto the wheel and continues to drive forward. He's almost there. 
to the key house and dodge and the well. Within the key house, Tyler sits in a lounge chair, playing with the lighter and its flame while watching the news. Tyler is becoming numb to the sting of the flame. He's also becoming numb to the news. Vandalism on a synagogue wall, the constant war on terror, school hazing rituals, even a passenger bus that has been consumed by fire just two blocks away from the Borough Street Station. None of it even phases Tyler. His mother asks him if he's okay, and he tells her that he is. He's just waiting for the sports to turn on. On the outskirts of the property, near the front gate, Kinsey speaks to one of the police officers on duty. He tells Kinsey to please tell her mom to stop sending the food down to him. It'll spoil his girlish figure. Actually, Kinsey corrects him, my uncle thought you'd want that. He does most of the cooking. Anyway, she tells him, she's just out collecting more lightning bugs for Bodhi. Her mom doesn't like him wandering around at night alone. Not with, you know. The police officer tells Kinsey that there isn't anything to worry about. He's out there, and there's a bunch of ocean separating their backyard from the rest of the mainland. Bodhi is going to be fine. Within the well house, Dodge ascends out of the darkness and grabs onto Bodhi, covering his mouth so that he can't yell for help. Can you promise me not to scream, Bodhi? If you do, I'll have to throw you down the well, and I don't want to do that. Besides, Dodge continues as she loosens her grip, if you'll be good, in a few minutes I'll let you go. You're a liar, Bodhi says. You're just saying that like you said you couldn't get out the well. Actually, Bodhi, I said I couldn't climb out the well. And that's true. I didn't climb. And that is the truth, too. I promise. And I keep all of my promises. I bet even your mother can't say that. What do you want? Bodhi asks. Out. But you can't go through the front door without fading away. You said, unless that was a lie too. No, that was true. I really am an echo of my former self, but I won't be leaving by the front door. The anywhere key, Bodhi concludes. But I don't know where it is. Do you? No. Your father took great pains to make that one hard to find, as if any of the keys in this place could stay lost. You're a smart boy, Bodhi. I think by now, you already know how we're going to find it. I'm glad you came to see me tonight. You saved me a step. I was going to have Sam bring you to me. Bodhi flinches at the sound of his name. Poor, brilliant Sam. Did you know they skipped him over 8th grade after he finished the entire year's reading in 9 days? His mother celebrated with her second arrest for drug possession in a year. He killed my dad, Bodhi whispers. That's not the only thing about him that matters, you know. Yes, it is. So, what brought you around to see me, Bodhi? So late at night, especially if you decided you don't trust me anymore. Tears begin to form in Bodhi's eyes. You knew something about my dad, so I figured if you really are an echo, you must be an echo of someone who knew him. I just want to know who. Dodge winks at Bodhi and tells him, My names are Legion, Bodhi, but I'll tell you what. In a place called Once Upon a Time, your daddy would have done anything to make me happy. And before tonight is over, you're going to feel the same way. Outside, on the property, Kinsey calls out for her brother for some time. His ten minutes are up. Finally, when she sees a light shining her way, she believes that it could be no one else but her younger brother. Kinsey covers her eyes from the blinding light. So, did you catch a big mess of fireflies? 
I got a few, but they're fast little. Hey, Bodhi, you wanna not shine that thing my way? She doesn't receive an answer. Instead, she is struck on the side of the face with a heavy metal flashlight, causing her to spit out blood and fall to the ground. Her mouth, already beginning to swell, also starts flooding with even more blood. She cannot speak. She urgently attempts to crawl away, but Sam steps on her back and starts to apply pressure to her spine. Then, he beats her with the flashlight until she stops moving. And then, he continues to beat her until he breaks the flashlight's lens through sheer force. There is nothing but silence on the property as Sam Lesser approaches the key house. With Kinsey thrown over his shoulder, he examines the area in order to find the most advantageous entry point to the residence. As he passes the basement door, he hears a muffled voice speaking from downstairs. Mrs. Locke and Duncan are arguing about the keys to the doors. There's always been something faulty about some of the locks in the doors. Sometimes, Duncan tells her, the keys just stick and you just have to jiggle it a little bit. Sam throws Kinsey's unconscious body on the ground and descends the steps into the basement. He hides behind a wall and peers over to find Duncan and Mrs. Locke, Nina, entering the wine cellar. Duncan explains to his sister Elaine that he has been worrying about her. She certainly has been drinking more lately. What'd you say? Nina asks. Nina, I... I think you're going to need help. Wow, you aren't kidding. I can't find a thing in here. Where are the bottles my mom sent? Duncan sighs and tells her that he put them on the high rack. It's organized by region. Everything from Napa is on the left. Sam waits for Duncan to enter the cellar. He then sneaks to close the door and silently turns the key to the lock and returns to Kinsey to drag her limp body to the basement. Uh, hello? Duncan asks. Nina, however, is a little quicker to anger. Hey, that's not funny. Open the fucking door. Nina begins to viciously hammer at the thick wooden door with her cane, calling for her son Tyler to help, to grab the others, to run, anything. She continues to bludgeon at the doorway until her cane breaks. Tyler, still watching TV, hears a noise coming from the basement and rises to his feet to inspect the area. Tyler opens the door to the basement only to be greeted by Sam Lesser. Be calm, Tyler. No sudden moves and all that stuff. Now, let's go downstairs. Tyler steps onto the descending staircase, putting his hands up in the air and follows Sam's instructions. He asks Sam if he is at all aware that there are police officers stationed at the property. Sam's only response is, if I see any cops around tonight, everyone in your family dies. Whereas if we can keep this between us, maybe I'll only kill a few of them. Sam kicks Tyler square in the back off of the staircase, breaking and splintering the wood as Tyler crashes to the floor. Tyler lands face first on the floor, and when he looks up, he sees his sister dripping with blood barely a yard away. He scurries to his feet and kneels down in order to examine her closer. With Tyler now being distracted, Sam walks over and slowly picks up a piece of wood from the broken staircase and, with all his might, swings it and knocks Tyler on the side of the head. Sam then grabs his gun and drags Tyler closer to the cellar door. Mrs. Locke, I hope you're listening. I'm out here with Ty. There's something I want. Something your husband wouldn't give me. I hope you can, because if you don't, I'm going to kill Tyler. Then I'm moving on to your other children. Give me what I want, Mrs. Locke, or they all die. Within the well house, Dodge, the Echo, tells Bodhi that it's time. She asks Bodhi if he finds it at all curious that there has been nothing but silence for the last half hour. No one has yelled for him. No one has come looking. And that is because Sam is up there, trying in his clumsy way to get Dodge what she wants. Is he going to kill my mom? Bodhi asks. 
asks. I think there's an excellent chance he'll kill them all. There is only one person who can turn Sam Lesser off and save your family now. Me. Run away, little Bodie. Run and get the Anywhere key and bring it to me. Straight away. Don't be seen and don't try to get the police. Sam will kill them for sure if he sees police, Bodie. Get the key and bring it back. Set me free and I promise, I promise you, I will allow Sam to do no more harm to your family this evening. Bodie scrambles and leaves Dodge, running at full speed in the direction of the key house. I told you already, Bodie. I don't make promises lightly, but when I do, I always keep them. Go. Go now. Fly away. Vroom. Vroom. Bodie plays with his orange toy truck and blue bus on the floor of the coroner's office. Their brakes are shot and there's no hope left for anyone inside. They're gonna crash. Suddenly, someone calls his name. It's a weak voice but Bodie recognizes it as his father's. He looks up at the black bag on the coroner's cart as it begins to sit up. Knock, knock. Bodie lets out a yell and pushes himself back, distancing himself from his father. Terrified, Bodie tells himself that there isn't anything to be afraid of. His dad would never hurt him. The dead can't hurt him. He's going to be all right. Who's there? Bodhi's father begins to creep out of the bag, revealing the hole in his head where his right eye should be. Who? Bodhi shoots up in his bed, tears in his eyes as he wakes up. Who, who? He looks around and grips onto his bus and truck. There is no one around to console him as he sits up in his bed from his night terror, and he continues to cry. Somewhere in Ohio, Sam Lesser makes his way through the state, hitchhiking with various drivers through some more than regrettable means. The driver wonders what has him on the road. There must be someone worrying about him somewhere. Maybe his mom, his dad, maybe some folks at school. Sam isn't sure what the driver has figured out, but he knows what happens next. As soon as they get to Massachusetts, before, Sam's mom had other priorities. His father, abusive. The others at school, not much better. When a bully, Rob McIntyre, pushed Sam too far, he snapped. He was suspended for a while. When he came back to school, he met Al Grove. Al, for one, heard how badass Sam was. He would have thought that going rabid on someone would get you expelled. It would have, Sam tells Al, but Mr. Locke bailed him out. He said that it would ruin his chances for... He doesn't finish his thought. Yeah, Mr. Locke is pretty righteous. He's helping me get out of here and into vocational. Plus, have you seen his wife? She brings her car by the right wash and has me detail it all the time. And she wears these little skirts, you know? She does it so as she gets out of her ride, she can open her legs and flash me her panties. First time she did it, I thought it was by accident. After four or five times, though, you know what she wants. At that moment, Tyler storms out of his father's office. Christ, Dad, will you lay off my ass for once? His father tells him that it's his job to nag on him and Tyler will find a way to govern that mouth of his. Tyler bellows back, I've had enough. I've had enough. Enough. The word echoes between Tyler's ears. It's deafening. Tyler makes his way to the shed and he looks up at the available tools over the workbench. A shovel, some hedge clippers, a hatchet, a shotgun. Enough. 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 Ty? Bodhi peeks his head around the open corner. Are you okay? 
Bodhi tiptoes over to his brother and tugs at his shirt. What do you want? Tyler asks while turning around. I need to know the end of a joke. Tyler turns around. The end of a... What? Bodhi puts up his hands in defense. Wait, it's important. Really? Knock, knock, who's there who? Um, who, who? Tyler mutters, unsure of what his little brother is asking from him. Right, what's the rest? The rest? What are you... Get it? Who, who? Are you an owl? Bodhi fixes his face to show his confusion. But that doesn't mean anything. Disappointed, Bodhi turns around to leave. But before he does, he asks his brother again if he's okay. I'm cool, kid. Go on now. Go on now and play ghost or something. Tyler has had enough of it. Of who he is. Of what he did. He's had enough. But he doesn't know what it would do to Bodhi if he stepped out that door. The little weirdo needs someone to tell him the important stuff. Like knock-knock jokes. Bodhi needs someone to pretend life can be like it was. And Tyler can fake it with the best of them. It's just hard. It's hard without his father. Tyler really didn't want him to die. Not ever. No matter what he said to Sam. Somewhere at a truck stop, not too far away, the truck driver tells Sam that it's the end of the line. If Sam hangs out there, he'll eventually be able to catch a bus. The driver also notices that he never asked Sam what his name was. Sam does not reveal any personal information. Instead, he just thanks the man for driving him all that way. I'm just looking for ways to help, the man says. What happens next is up to you. Hey, I've got friends coming through here. They get real lonely on the road. I can set you up. No thank you, Sam tells him. Before, within Mr. Locke's office, Sam thanks Mr. Locke for all the help he has given. Well, that's funny you should say that, Sam. I don't know if you'll be thanking me in a minute. Why don't you sit down? Instead, Sam looks over at a photo hanging on the wall. He recognizes it as a Locke's summer home up in Willits. He heard Tyler talking about it before with his friend, Rod, in the cafeteria. Sam tells Mr. Locke that his uncle, his dad's brother, lives in Willits. He's a good guy, like his dad. Mr. Locke would have met him by now, but he's busy. Sam glances over to the painting on the wall and becomes captivated. Who painted this? He asks. My little brother. It's an old well house behind the place where I grew up back in good old Lovecraft M.A. Pretty senseless if you ask me. The water is undrinkable. Stupid spot for a well. I have no idea- Oh, never mind. I got those financial aid forms for you. Thank you, Sam tells him, glancing away from the picture of the well, but only for a moment. When he looks back, he sees a woman in black, waving at him. I've been meaning to talk to you about that, Sam. But Sam is already lost, transfixed upon the painting. Now, just watching, watching as the woman in black spells out six letters with her fingers. H, E, L, P, M, E. Help me. Sam, Sam, I can help you with financial aid but I can't help you with a recommendation letter. I have very real concerns about your emotional health. There are people you can talk to, Sam. Good people. People you can trust with your problems. You there, Sam? Sam tells Mr. Locke that he's listening, but he isn't. He's reading the rest of what the woman wrote. Listen to the echoes. Sam. Mr. Locke says, placing a hand on the boy's shoulder. I just told you I can't write your college recommendation letter, and I think you need to talk to a therapist. Your thoughts? Oh, Sam mumbles as he is shaken back to reality. Okay, whatever you want. Sam leaves the office without saying another word and continues to exit the school altogether. He sees Tyler sitting on the front steps of the building 
and asks if he can join him in his waiting. Noticing Tyler's disposition, he tries to reason with Tyler that he saw his argument with his father. Mr. Locke seems like a good guy. Sam would have never thought him and his son would argue like that. He's an overbearing asshole, and I can't ever just make a mistake. Every fuck up is a damn moral lesson. Oh yeah, I understand that, Sam begins. You can't imagine how often I wake up thinking I ought to kill my dad today. Tyler lets out a weak laugh before telling Sam that if he ever decides to kill his dad, Sam should do Tyler a favor and kill his too while he's at it. There is a long silence before Sam asks Tyler if he's waiting on a ride. Tyler tells Sam that he's just waiting on his dad. What about you? You all set for a ride? Well, Sam says, there's always the bus. In the present day, Sam waits as the bus eases forward, screeching its brakes as it halts. Money in hand, he pays the bus driver for the transportation and ascends the steps into the vehicle. Hopefully, his new hat and coat will be enough to hide his identity for just a little while longer. The truck driver, that he had crossed the greater part of the eastern country with, lay dead behind the wheel of his truck. A tire iron smashed into his eye socket. Blood splattered across the dashboard. Take your seats. Woodburn, next stop. Woodburn, five miles. Within the key house, Duncan and Kinsey carry large boxes of wine into the cellar underneath the residence. Nice place for a medieval torture chamber, Kinsey says. Good thing Graham sent more wine, otherwise they'd be down to their last 300 bottles. Her mom is going to need at least a month to drink all of it. Come on, Kinsey, you know your mom, she- Bodie! Hey, what's up, little man? Bodie sneaks from around the corner and tells the two that he followed them so he could tell them a joke. Okay, must be a good one. Fire away. Knock, knock. Who's there? Who? Who, who? What are you, an owl? Needless to say, the joke fell flat. Uh, right. Great joke, Bodie, Kinsey tells him. Yeah, but does it mean anything? I think it means no to a career in stand-up, Kinsey chuckles as she hands Duncan the box of wine for him to place on top of the shelf. It's just a joke? Bodie asks. It's just a joke, Kinsey confirms. What are you, an echo? Duncan asks. No, I'm just saying, no, that's the other way the joke goes, Duncan says. At least, that's how I remember it from when I was a kid. An echo? Bodie ponders. An echo? On the bus, Sam doesn't trust the woman with the baby. She's been staring at Sam since Saugus. She knows something. Sam thinks that she recognizes him. It's his face. Maybe she saw his face in the paper. It's a hard face to forget. When she gets up to talk to the driver, half a mile from their last stop in Lynn, he knows, and he knows what to do about it. He's less than 10 miles from Lovecraft and Key House, and Dodge. Dodge set him free, and now he has to return the favor. He just needs the key. Before, when Sam had Mr. Locke at gunpoint, he demands for the keys. If he will just give Sam the keys, then all of this will stop now. The what? Mr. Locke asks, the key to anywhere and the key to the black door. I know you took them, and Dodge wants them back. Sam, you're confused, but Sam won't listen. He bashes Mr. Locke above the eye with the butt of the gun. Dodge said you might not remember. Dodge said that grown-ups don't believe. That's how the key house protects itself. It makes you forget when you're too old to use the doors. But you need to remember, in a hurry, you can start with the Anywhere key. Wait, what are you doing? Stay on your knees. I don't know what you're talking about, Sam. And I wouldn't give you what you wanted, even if I did. 
I'm getting up now, and if you're going to shoot me, you better do it. What happens next is up to you. But Sam has always been good at figuring out what happens next. It's like a gift. It's so simple, Sam says, with the barrel of the gun pointed to Tyler's head. I only want two keys, the key to anywhere and the key to the black door. Nina tells Sam if he hurts any of her children, she will do nothing short of kill him. Duncan, who chooses a milder approach, attempts to reason with Sam, telling him that him and Nina don't understand. No, Sam responds. People your age can't understand. Really? Let me put it this way. I'm looking for two very old keys. One has the Omega symbol on it. The other, a series of rings connected to rings. Do you know what I'm talking about now? Nina, from the other side of the door, attempts to speak with Sam. Yes, all right, I saw them. I came across them when we first unpacked. How do I know? If I tell you where they are, you won't just take them and kill my children anyway. Sam scoffs. There's a police officer down the road, parked at your gate. If he hears a gun go off, he'll come running. I'd prefer not to go back to jail, but I will if I have to. Now, if you give me the keys, I'll just go as I came and no one has to die. Duncan, becoming more nervous with the precarious situation, asks his sister-in-law what she is doing, but she only responds with a hushed palm. Besides, Sam continues, I honestly don't see what other options you have. The keys you want are in my bedroom. I threw them in a dresser drawer. Ty can show you. You can show him, Ty, yes? You can get what he needs? Ty lifts his head and confirms his mother's request from the other side of the door before Sam leads him away. Duncan, still worried, asks Nina if she really knew what Sam was talking about. No, she responds. No? Then why did you send him up there? Because that's where the gun is. Elsewhere, within Key House, Bodhi turns the black key to open the black door. Please work? He thinks as he passes through the doorway and his physical body collapses to the floor. When you're a ghost, all you have to do to go to someone or some place is to think about them really hard. You don't need to know where they are. You just go. So think about the anywhere key. Think. Think. Bodhi struggles to weed through his thoughts, which are already cloudy. And think. 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 He rubs the side of his temples. Think! Think! Finally, it works. Bodhi appears near the bloody body of his sister. Oh no! Oh, Kinsey, don't be dead! Stop it. She's not dead. She's breathing. She's not dead, and this isn't where I need to go. I want to go to the Anywhere Key. Please! Within a flash of light, Bodhi disappears and reappears exactly where he was. No, no, no! This isn't right! Why do I keep going to Kinsey? This was supposed to work! This was supposed to take me right... right to it. This time, when Bodhi looks at his sister, his eyes are drawn to the bracelet on her wrist. It's golden glimmer in a series of rings connected to rings. It takes no time at all for Bodhi to realize what he must do. He goes back through the black door and wakes up from his temporary slumber. As he scrambles to his feet, he kicks the door closed and begins to scuffle away to the basement. As Bodhi leaves the room, the black key in the door slowly turns its way to the right, clicking as it tilts the tumblers within the keyhole until it locks in place. As Bodhi opens the door on the opposite side of the room, he sees his brother Tyler being led up the staircase at gunpoint by Sam Lesser. I'm lost, Tyler says. I want to be surprised. This place is huge, Sam says, looking around at some of the antique furniture and the rest of his surroundings. 
No, I mean, I don't understand. You want a pair of keys that you think we have them? Why? Sam presses the barrel of the gun into Tyler's back before telling him, I tell you, but you just think I'm crazy. That was a joke, Ty. You might think I'm crazy. Get it? I don't expect you to laugh. As Tyler reaches the top of the staircase, he asks, Is that what this is all about? You killed my dad because you thought he had something you wanted? No, Tyler. I came to see him to get the keys, but I killed him because you asked me to. I told him that too, right before I shot him, that you asked me to kill him. You should have seen his face. Bodie makes his way to the basement and immediately sees the broken and splintered staircase. On the other side of the room, Kinsey still lay there unconscious on the dirty floor. He runs over to her and gently lifts her arm in order to remove her bracelet. Oh, Kinsey, please be alright. Bodie's mom hears him from the other side of the cellar door. Bodie? Is that you? Are you okay? Yeah, mom, I'm fine. Can you let us out? Bodie examines the lock in the door. He took the key. Run then. Run and get help. Bodie backs up from the door and rushes up the stone steps back into the house. I will. I'm going to get help right now. Upstairs, Sam and Tyler make it to Mrs. Locke's room and Sam tries to keep his attention on Tyler, but there are so many fancy items that catch his eye. Nice room. Nice house. I wonder what you did to deserve such a nice house. Not a damn thing, Tyler admits. That's right. Don't move. Sam makes his way to Mrs. Locke's dresser and begins to rifle through her underwear drawer. My friend Al said your mother used to flash her panties at him when she dropped her car off at the car wash where he worked. I wonder if he made that up. This is pretty boring underwear. Not like the stuff Al described. Uh-oh. While Sam was preoccupied, Tyler attempted to sneak into his mother's nightstand in order to grab the gun stored inside. Unfortunately, the mirror above his mother's dresser reveals his plans to Sam before it can come to fruition. Sam lifts his gun back at Tyler. Whatever you're reaching for, leave it and lay on the floor. I thought this smelled bad. Your mom making it so easy for me. Sam walks over to the nightstand and sees the loaded gun hidden within its compartment. Sam smiles as he examines the weapon. A few moments pass, and Tyler notices Sam's captivation and attempts to slowly ease his way out of the open door. Sam tells Tyler, You want to hear something funny? The gun I've been holding to your head? It was empty. I don't expect you to laugh. You know, your mom just wasn't thinking, trying to fake me out. She won't make that same mistake twice. Ty? Tyler, hands still bound, makes his way out of the open door and runs down the stairs. Just shoot me, he thinks. I don't care. There hasn't been a day since dad died I didn't wish you killed me with him, so shoot already. But you won't do that, will you? because that would bring the cop. If I can get outside and start yelling, Tyler gets to the bottom of the staircase and almost slips on a small carpet as he runs to the black door. He attempts to open it, but it's locked. He attempts to unlock it as quickly as possible, begging for God to please let something go right for once. Finally, the black key turns and unlocks the door and it begins to swing open. I did it! I can make it! I can save everyone! I'm a hero! Sam catches up with Tyler and strikes him in the back of the head with the butt of the gun. Tyler falls on his back just inches away from the open doorway. Sam quickly tucks the gun behind him and reaches for Tyler's neck, choking him to the floor, revealing Sam's vicious, jet black, self-made tattoo on his left arm. No, you don't! No, you don't! No, you don't. Stay down, Tyler. Stay 
down. Tyler becomes weak. His eyes turn listless and dull, and he loses all fight in him. How about that? Sam says. Big kid like you? I never would have figured it'd be so easy to kill you. Sam turns to leave, leaving Tyler's body lying halfway through the open black door. Outside the house, Bodie crosses the creek and makes his way down the steps to the window of the well house. When he arrives, he holds out the item. I found it! The Anywhere Key! My sister was wearing it. It was part of her favorite bracelet. A bracelet? Dodge asks as he reaches out to grab the piece of jewelry. Let me have it. Well, look at that. I think I knew this once. That the Anywhere Key was hidden in a bracelet. Your father, though, Bodhi. I told you he took pains to make the Anywhere Key hard for me to find, but I didn't tell you how. Your father used a key on me, unlocked my thoughts, and took my memories. All to keep his secrets. All because he was afraid. That was how the trouble began, when he started hiding things from me. Bodhi, with confusion painted on his face, tells Dodge that he doesn't understand, so she continues, No, you can't understand, because you're reading the last chapter of something without reading the first chapters. You're a little guy, Bodhi. Kids always think they're coming into a story at the beginning, when usually they're coming at the end. Dodge examines the bracelet and the many engraved rings, at the key carefully hidden within. She then squeezes the bracelet until the key protrudes. With the key now being easily accessible, Dodge continues to pull it out. Thank you for this, she tells Bodhi as she discards the now useless bracelet down the well. Dodge then walks over and enters the key into the tool closet lock and opens it. She enters the doorway and closes the door behind her. Seeing this, Bodhi squeezes between the bars guarding the window and runs to the closet door. When he opens it, he finds nothing but discarded garden tools. Dodge arrives in the bedroom of Kinsey Lock and examines the area. She then reaches into the brown pouch fastened around her neck and pulls from it another key. This one with the engraving of a man and woman split down the middle by the two symbols of the sexes. Around the faces of the man and woman, the medical Ouroboro as well as a number of smaller engravings, including an Uzumaki spiral and an artifact of northeastern African origin. Dodge looks into Kinsey's closet and pushes her clothes to the side to reveal a small door with a woman in the fetal position engraved on the doorknob. She enters the key into the lock of the small door and enters. Suddenly, from within the closet in Tyler's room, a rustling and stirring is made before Dodge emerges. Now, no longer a woman, Dodge emerges a man of no more than 17 or 18. He stands up straight and examines his body. Some changes were obviously more major than others. Namely, his hair still retained its length, and his dress now didn't fit. I've got to find something else to wear, he says, almost amused at what the night is taking him. He reaches into Tyler's closet and snags a red sweater. Something that goes with balls. At the black door, Tyler, in a spectral form, hovers over his dead body. I'm dead, he thinks. He killed me. Oh my god, oh no, no, don't do this to my mom. Not after dad. Please don't do this to my... Mom? Tyler is instantly teleported to the wine cellar where his mom and Duncan wait. It went bad, she tells Duncan. We don't know that, Duncan counters, afraid to assume the worst. They've been gone for too long, she reasons. Oh Jesus, Duncan, what did I do? She is interrupted by three knocks coming from the other side of the door. How you doing in there? Sam asks. Duncan, still trying the gentler approach, tells Sam, we're okay, Sam. Just enjoying the wine cellar. How about you? I'm fine, 
Sam tells them. Ty's not so good, though. I kind of had to choke him to death when the key wasn't where you said it was. Sorry. No! Nina yells. No! I don't believe you! I don't! Duncan, seeing his sister-in-law, doubles down on his efforts to escape from captivation. Sam? I think you're too smart to have done anything to Tyler. To that, Sam simply says, I can't open the door to show you, but I have Tyler right here. Don't worry, I have to wake up Kinsey now and she'll tell you that he's really dead. Then we can do this again with her. Maybe this time, you'll give me what I want. No, 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 no! Tyler thinks as he watches the interaction between his attacker and his family. Make this stop. I don't want to be dead anymore. Tyler suddenly appears back at the black door, and he instantly remembers a conversation he had with Bodhi a little while ago. He just thought Bodhi was playing around. If he can remember correctly, Bodhi said, And when you're a ghost, you can fly through walls and go places just by thinking, and then when you don't want to be dead anymore, you just go back through the magic door and wake up inside your body. So, that's what Tyler does. Within the basement, Sam shakes Kinsey awake. Wake up, Kinsey. Wake up, and then we can talk about what happens next. Kinsey, whose mouth is still partially swollen shut, attempts to scream out for help. I've always been good at that, knowing exactly what's going to happen next. I'm practically psychic. After going through the black door, Tyler's spirit travels back into his body. His skin becomes flushed with color and his eyes become lively once again as he slowly eases back into existence. Noticing that Sam is distracted, Tyler barrels forward, shoulder first, in order to tackle him to the ground. He's able to catch Sam by surprise and this results in Sam dropping the gun out of his hand. Tyler, whose hands are still fastened by the duct tape that Sam forced him to apply before exploring the house, stands over Sam and prepares to hammer down on him with the strength of both fists. Your future's looking a lot like your past, Sam. You and me, hanging out in the basement, me kicking your ass again. Sam attempts to crawl away until he is in reach of a shovel. He grabs the shovel and turns in a clockwise direction to gain enough momentum to strike Tyler in the back of his kneecap. The pain forces Tyler down to one knee. Sam stands to his feet and lifts the shovel above his head before preparing to strike down on the back of Tyler's. You are dead. I liked you that way. Sam is interrupted at the last moment by a bullet being shot through his throat and blood bursts through the newly formed hole. Out of instinct, Sam covers the hole in his neck and hopes to stall the ongoing blood loss. He races to the stairway to try to distance himself in the mystery shooter, and another round fires off nearly missing his head and hitting a stone pillar before ricocheting off into the distance. The gun fires again. This time, the bullet punctures Sam's left thigh, only inches above his knee. The gun fires again. Kinsey! Kinsey! He's gone. You got him. You saved my ass. Tyler says with a hug, attempting to stop, calm, and thank his sister all in one attempt. Yeah. Kinsey says weakly. Well, mom was locked up, so I figured it had to be me. Elsewhere, within the house, Sam crawls away, leaving a massive trail of blood. Soon, he is approached by the newly formed Dodge. I, I, what? I, oh, oh god, it's you. Sam realizes as he reaches out to Dodge. I tried. I tried so hard. Dodge kneels down and hugs Sam close. Sam, you did fine. You did your best. Dodge's grip tightens and tears begin to form in Sam's eyes. Uh-huh. Now, you'll have to let me take it from here. Dodge, with a simple shift in his weight, snaps Sam's neck and begins to drag him away. I keep my promises, Sam. I promised you a new home, a new beginning, and now you're going to get it. 
Dodge continues to pull Sam along through the house and even more egregious amounts of blood begin to spill out of Sam, leaving an even larger trail in their wake. Soon, you will be more powerful than you could ever imagine. And I still need you, Sam. I need you so much. Isn't that what you always wanted? Someone to need you? Dodge stops at the black door and lifts up Sam's body and tosses the boy outside. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm the only one who's ever loved you, Sam. And don't you forget it. Sam's body crashes to the ground outside the house and Dodge closes the door behind him. Everything is going perfectly. Dodge makes his way to another door in the room and unlocks it with the Anywhere key. From outside the room, he can hear a voice calling out to the other police officers, telling them that they have blood in the hall, telling him to come out slowly with his hands in the air. Dodge, unfazed by the orders of the officer, swings open the door and enters it, transporting him to another place some ways away from Key House. As the door closes behind him, Detective Mutuku arrives. Nobody move. Nobody. Huh? Elsewhere, it is nearly midnight when the track coach gets woken up by the repeated ringing of her doorbell. Oh, come on, she says, assuming it's another goddamn prank. If it's one of her kids, they better be goddamn ready to run their asses off tomorrow. Coming, she yells as she puts on her nightgown and slippers. Hey, you clowns, if this is a joke and my boy gets woke up, the punchline is going to be one pissed off coach making a pack of snot-nosed kids run suicides all day. The coach opens up the door, and what she sees shakes her so much that she cannot even muster up a vow. Hello, Ellie, Dodge says. You look great. Mind if I come in? I mean, I killed your mother for you. It's the least you could do. The next morning, the police are still on scene at the key house. Detective Mutuku asks Duncan if he can take one more look at where Sam Lesser's body wound up. On the ground, outside the black door. Sure, no problem, Duncan says. Let me unlock it. Duncan rifles through his pocket and pulls out a key with a nine on it. Tyler tries to tell his uncle to wait, to be careful with that door, but Duncan doesn't hear him. Duncan enters the key into the door and turns it, unlocking the door and begins to step outside. He looks left and right before throwing his hands up in confusion. I suppose he was trying to get outside? Maybe drag his way back to the boat? Detective Mutuku scratches his chin at this notion. Something doesn't add up. Tyler, seeing this, steps closer to the open doorway and lifts his hand up. He extends his arm out the doorway, attempting to make sense of the events from before. He reels his hand back when he thinks about how close he was to dying. Tyler? His mom asks and places a hand on his shoulder. What are you looking at? Tyler turns to his mother and tells her, For a while there, I thought it was gone. I thought he killed me, right where we're standing. Nina throws her arm over her son's shoulder. Nope, you're sticking around, Mama says. Tyler smiles and tells her, sounds good to me. Two weeks later, Kinty hangs close to her brother Bodie as he fishes in the creek. How come you never turn into a ghost anymore, Bodie? I don't know what happened to the key. I don't like that game. Sam Lesser has a bunch of crazy ideas about keys. Mom told me. It's creepy, Bodie. Bodie? Kinsey turns to look at her brother. It was all make-believe, wasn't it? About the key and the door and how you turn into a ghost? Bodie doesn't answer. He has been uncharacteristically, but expectedly, quiet as of late. Tyler joins his two siblings and asks, how's their fishing going? It's not catching fish. Kinsey tells him. It's catching, uh, hello. 
Kinsey is caught off guard at the sight of a boy in a red shirt with black hair following closely after her brother. This is Zack, Tyler tells him. He's new at the academy, just like us. Zack confirms this by saying that he missed orientation week in the first couple of days of classes, but better late than never. He kneels down to be at eye level with the two younger siblings. I'm actually living with your running coach, he tells Kinsey. <laughs> She's tough. I hear you're no one to mess around with either. Oh, d did you? Kinsey asks, attempting to hide her growing smile. Zack then turns to Bodhi. You must be Bodhi. Ty told me so much about you. I feel like we're already old buddies. Bodhi doesn't respond. He just looks back at Zack. A feeling of unease creeps over him. Hey, Bodhi, Tyler says as he nudges his brother forward. You want to say hello to Zack? Hello, Bodhi says weakly. Kinsey interrupts their lack of conversation to welcome Zack to Lovecraft, to which he responds, You guys just moved here too. So, right back at you. We're going down to the beach. You want to come? Kinsey says yes and joins the two as they make their way back up to the hill. Tyler calls out to Bodhi to catch up with them, and Bodhi tells them one second. He just got something. Bodhi reels in the Ultimate Treasure Finder 2000 to find a small bronze key with the number 8 on it. Its base, the shape of a skull with engravings indicating different centers of the brain. How weird, Bodhi thinks. Another one. 